Honourable Members, the Speaker. Order. The clerk. Government business order of the day number eight. Appropriation bill number one, 2007 2008. Second reading, resumption of the debate on the budget. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Australians expected a lot with the election of a new government. Last year they listened to what the now Prime Minister and Treasurer had to say. They heard them say that they were going to be good economic managers. They heard them say that they would do something about grocery prices. They heard them say that they would do something about the price of petrol. They heard them say they would do something about home interest rates. They heard a lot. Every Australian should now ask themselves this question. Will this budget make it easier for me to keep my home, to fill my trolley with groceries, to put petrol in my car and to keep my job. The Prime Minister and Treasurer have styled themselves as new Labor leaders, yet this is old Labor, returning to haunt the Australian economic landscape again. This is an old-fashioned, high-taxing, high-spending Labor budget that seeks to punish those that it does not like and discourage aspiration. The government promised to ease the pressure on working families, but failed the very people they promised to help. How can any government boast of a budget that proposes to put 134,000 Australians into unemployment? Under the coalition, it was welfare to work. Under Labor, we are headed again on the road from work to welfare. How can they boast of a budget that largely ignores the men and women whose sacrifices built this nation, seniors and retirees? How can they boast of a budget that doesn't even leave carers in the lurch but sells them down the river? Where are the incentives for small family business? Where was the emphasis on water, on farmers, on rural and regional Australia? This budget, like this government, puts media spin ahead of substance bureaucratic double-speak ahead of people, and more than 100 reviews, inquiries and committees ahead of decisions. There is no substitute for a sound economic strategy, and Australians know it. For months, the nervous man that is now Treasurer <laughs> talked up an inflation genie as being out of the bottle. He spoke of an inflationary crisis. He darkly warned that deep funding cuts were needed. Yet he has delivered a budget that actually increases spending and increases taxes. Far from slaying inflation, this budgetary approach risks breathing new life into it. This budget will do little to reassure Australians, nervous that this Treasurer and this government really understand what they are doing. In contrast, the Liberal and National parties have enormous demonstrated experience to keep a strong, competitive Australian economy and make sound judgments according to economic circumstances. Yeah. Mr Speaker, since last November's election, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer have been more concerned with undermining and misrepresenting the Howard Costello legacy than they have been focused on the economic challenges facing Australia. We should never forget that the leadership of the coalition of John Howard and Peter Costello enabled Australia to become a stronger, more prosperous country, more confident in itself and our place in the world. Yeah. Australia was a dramatically different place when the coalition came to office in 1996. Under Labor, Australia had emerged from oppressively high interest rates, the collapse of businesses, and a recession that deeply scarred the nation. It was an Australia in which every parent feared for the future of their children. There was no talk of a skills crisis. In that very first budget, the Coalition faced a deficit of $10 billion and $96 billion in accumulated labour debt. Last November, by contrast, 
We handed to the new Prime Minister and the new Treasurer an economy the envy of the world. There was no Commonwealth debt, surplus budgeting is now accepted as the norm, and more than $60 billion was then invested in Australia's future. During the 12 years the Coalition was in government, everything that should be up—wages, economic growth, business and consumer confidence—was up, and everything that should be down—inflation, interest rates and unemployment—was down. <laughs> Under the coalition government, Australians were able to get ahead. This sound economic management and economic prosperity took place in the face of the Asian financial crisis of the late 1990s, the US recession of 2001, the tech wreck, the SARS epidemic, the terrorist attacks of September 11 and in Bali, and in the midst of the worst drought in 100 years. We took these challenges in our stride because we know that managing a trillion-dollar economy is never easy. The Labor Party steadfastly opposed every single coalition measure that was essential to getting Australia into the position that it found itself in November last year. Before the election, the Prime Minister repeatedly styled himself as an economic conservative. Expensive advertisements, slick management, Cardboard cutouts and expensive suits do not make economic conservatives. It is deeply rooted in philosophical conviction and character. Today, Australians are not confident about our economy. Business and consumer confidence has plunged to record-breaking lows, despite the fundamentals still being strong. Retail sales have fallen. Building approvals have fallen flat. House values have fallen in many suburbs, and Australians are less confident in both the economy and in their government. All this before the global liquidity crisis is yet to fully wash through the Australian economy and Labor's inflationary, job-destroying rollback on workplace relations. Union bosses are back in town, and we have no confidence that this Prime Minister will be able to stand up to union intimidation. Why would he? After all, they invested so much money in getting him into government. Under Labor, there is little opportunity for Australians to get ahead. This underwhelming budget is one of lost opportunity. The Prime Minister and Treasurer have presented their high-taxing budget as one that fights inflation. While no one should deny that there is an inflationary challenge to be managed, there is no crisis. The last Labor government ran inflation in excess of 6 per cent a year for six years, and it peaked at 8.3 per cent. Inflation is currently running at 4.25 per cent and is forecast to fall. We have never subscribed to the Treasurer's assertion that an inflation crisis justifies savage budget cuts at a time of significant domestic and global economic uncertainty. We do not support higher taxes and higher spending. Yes. For all his talk of slaying some dragon, the Treasurer has breathed new life into inflation, with a budget that delivers something Australians have not known in Commonwealth budgets in recent years—tax increases. The government has perpetrated a fraud on the Australian people. Preliminary calculations indicate that the budget will increase the CPI by up to 0.4 per cent. The price of alcohol is up. The price of cars is up. The price of groceries will be pressured, in part from higher taxes on trucks. The passenger movement charge is up. Taxes on software are up, and workers are about to have the Treasurer bite into their hard-earned money with a tax on canteen meal cards. And health insurance premiums will increase, with measures that will see a so far confirmed figure of half a million Australians, mainly young people, drop private health insurance, leaving families, retirees and pensioners to pay even higher premiums to keep their private health insurance. 
We will stand up for private health insurance. Yeah. We have always stood up for people with private health insurance and we will continue to do so. Yeah. We will oppose this measure. Yeah. These are real price increases and they will cut into household budgets of real Australians, many of whom can least afford to pay it. These price increases could also mean higher interest rates. And far from reducing spending and putting downward pressure on inflation, this budget increases spending. The Treasurer has not, as he says, taken the axe to irresponsible spending. He's merely taken a sledgehammer to people the Labor Party doesn't like and ignored others, seniors, carers, small business, rural and regional communities. The government has cut $15.2 billion from programs, but then it has added $30 billion in new labour spending programs. So net spending will increase by almost $15 billion over the forward estimates. The government has not paid for these new spending with cuts. The government has instead chosen to impose taxes and increase revenues that will raise $19.7 billion over the next five years. Far from reducing taxes to encourage incentive and workforce participation, this budget increases taxes. The total tax take will increase over this year alone by $15.7 billion. That is a 5.2 per cent increase in taxation in one single year. This is a high-taxing, high-spending Labor government. As for the income tax announced by the Treasurer on Tuesday night, bear in mind that these are the coalition tax cuts copied by the new Treasurer. He no longer, however, has a straight-A student in the form of Peter Costello to copy. As such, Australians have seen the last tax cut that they will see for some time. This budget confirms that Labor stands for higher taxes, whereas the coalition stands for lower taxes. Even after the income tax cuts, the total income tax takes from Australians will increase by $42.8 billion or 21 per cent over the next four years. Tax relief not only provides practical help for families, it also rewards hard work and self-sacrifice. It can also help tackle inflation by removing pressure for wage claims while encouraging people into work. The Treasurer demonstrated his lack of commitment to tax relief in January when he called for an end to the Howard government policy of returning excess budget surpluses as tax cuts. The Reserve Bank, he warned, had been allowed to shoulder too much responsibility for controlling inflation with interest rate rises. If the coalition tax relief delivered in this budget reduces inflation by promoting participation, encourages skills development, keeps wage pressures under control, as Labor accepts, doesn't that argument also apply for future tax cuts? Yeah. Clearly, the Treasurer does not believe his own argument. Labor is giving us something in one hand and taking it back with the other, and not just through knee-jerk measures such as the new Tarago tax on cars or the $1 slug on responsible Australians who happen to enjoy a pre-mixed Bundy and Coke or a Scotch and Dry. We know that as incomes rise over time and workers move into higher tax brackets, the value of today's tax cuts will be eroded in the future. Economists call it bracket creep. We call it tax increases on the sly. There must be a commitment to future tax relief. Yeah. Alcohol abuse is a problem. It is a real problem, confined not only to some young people, but right across society. I spent much of my medical life seeing its human consequences. I am also a parent. According to the government, the principal cause and source of binge drinking is the so-called alcopops or ready-to-drinks. A whopping 70 per cent, 70 per cent excise increase, we have been told, would make significant inroads into binge drinking. The evidence does not support the government's assertion. In fact, quite to the contrary. 
The National Drug Strategy Household Survey confirms binge drinking by young women since 2001 has actually declined, and alcohol abstinence in this group has increased. So the Prime Minister has told Australians that you've got to pay an extra $3.1 billion more in tax on one alcohol product to deal with binge drinking. Any parent, let alone a health economist, will confirm that if you jack up the price of alcohol in isolation from other measures, the kids will simply move on to another form of alcohol or a drug. The budget confirms that after its tax increase, after its tax increase, the government expects consumption of these products to grow at a rate of some 10 per cent per year, compounding. This is nothing more than a tax binge, falsely presented to Australians as something that it is not, and that is why we are angry about it. Yeah. We will oppose it. A real strategy, a real strategy to deal with alcohol abuse and antisocial behaviour demands an integration of education, of prevention, of policing, of media, of appropriate pricing measures and parenting where it involves young people. I will convene a national forum of alcohol specialists, educators, police, parents who are, where expertise in their field is involved and those who have expertise in related fields to develop a truly integrated approach to what is an undeniable problem. Yeah. This will involve more substance than style. Yeah. Before the election, the Prime Minister led the Australian public to believe that he would do something about the price of petrol. He has done nothing of substance. Watching petrol prices does not bring them down. <laughs> Order. Order. Australians may not have expected a silver bullet in the case of petrol, but they sure as hell deserve a government that does more than fire blanks. In 2001, when the price of petrol spiked sharply, we took the view that a strong budget allowed for some tangible relief. Petrol indexation was abolished. Petrol is now 17.7 cents a litre less than it would otherwise have been. The coalition did that. Petrol is now hurting Australians in every walk of life and in every part of the nation. There is only one way that an Australian government can actually do anything decisive about the price of petrol, and that's to cut taxes. So tonight I propose a cut in the fuel excise of five cents a litre. Yeah. This, this is a modest but meaningful way of helping all Australians, families, small businesses, pensioners and working people so dependent on their cars. Ninety per cent of the Australian households have a car. Right now they all need help, real help. The Coalition believes it responsible and fair to return a further $1.8 billion back to hard-working everyday Australians in the form of a five cent a litre reduction in the fuel excise. Yeah. By lowering the price of petrol and the cost of transporting goods, this 13 per cent reduction in petrol excise will also have a modest but measurable downward impact on inflation. Yeah. This is in stark contrast to the tax increases under Labor, which I have outlined, which will have an, uh, an impact on the CPI upwards of 0.4 per cent. The Coalition is serious about reducing price and inflation pressures. Labor talks, the Coalition acts. Yeah. This is a real tax cut in the best traditions of the Liberal and National parties. Yeah. It was the Keating Labor government that put five cents onto the excise in 1993. Yeah. We opposed it. I challenge the Rudd Labor government to help us take it out in 2008. Yeah. This is not a review. It's not a committee. It's not a summit. It's not an idea to have a meeting. It's a decision. It's decisive action. Yeah. Small family. Order. Small. Order. 
Small family businesses are the backbone of the nation. Indeed, it is one of the pillars of liberal belief. Men and women taking a risk, borrowing money to create or buy a small business and employ other Australians. Few things are more important to our way of life and our future prosperity. Get the conditions right for small business and employment will flourish and businesses will grow. We believe in encouraging and rewarding hard work. The tax system shouldn't stifle innovation and Australians who are prepared to have a go. Therefore, we're announcing tonight a reduction in capital gains tax for small business. The current 15-year rule with respect to waiving capital gains tax on the sale of a small business entity on retirement from age 55 was an incentive to small business introduced by the coalition in government. To further encourage small businessmen and women to invest in establishing or taking over a small business, the coalition will introduce a five-year rule for capital gains tax on sale of the business for retirement. Yeah. After owning and operating a small business for five years, we believe you should be entitled to capital gains tax relief should you sell your business for retirement. Yeah. You will be rewarded, as you should, for your hard work, determination and sacrifice. Yeah. Mr Speaker, education is our future. The centralised fund proposed by Labor for school infrastructure cannot replace parent power. Parent groups and school principals will always know what their school needs are much better than a clipboard-carrying bureaucrat turning up from a centralised education bureaucracy. The government has scrapped our Investing in Our Schools program. These direct grants to schools have made a big difference to improve buildings, classrooms, playgrounds and upgraded technology. The coalition will reinstate it. Yeah. We will get them moving again. The government speaks of a so-called education revolution in delivering more computers to schools, while ignoring the added cost to parents and schools of connection, of maintenance, of training. The single most important influence in the life of a child, apart from their parent, is their teacher. Yeah. But no teacher can teach what they do not know. The standard of teacher training in Australia must be improved. Yeah. It is unacceptably low. Higher standards in universities means higher standards in classrooms. In this, we are failing. The Coalition commits to education reform so essential to our economic and social development. The Coalition will require a number of conditions on Australian universities before they receive a dollar in public funding if they are training teachers. Entry scores to undergraduate teaching degrees in Australia universities are embarrassingly and pathetically low. The minimum university entrance score must be higher for entry to an education degree and will be formally set as a condition of funding. Science, humanities and social science departments will be required to set and or accredit relevant course content and assessment in education faculties. All trainee teachers will be taught how to teach children to read using proven techniques, including phonics-based instruction. They must also be taught and assessed in basic sciences, mathematics, English and history. University education faculties will be required to appoint high-quality classroom teachers to their academic staff as tutors and lecturers. We need more classroom teachers teaching in our universities and less social engineers. This will assist in lifting the status of teaching as a profession and it will bring a greater practical focus to the training of teachers. To attract our best graduates into teaching, we must provide quality teachers with access to increased pay. Like any other profession, teachers should be rewarded and recognised on merit as assessed by their peers. Better teachers deserve better pay. Yeah. There can be no place for mediocrity when it comes to the future of the nation's teachers, yet that is tolerated in too many of our teacher training institutions. This is an education revolution. Yeah. The Prime Minister has repeatedly told the House that he would reduce the financial stress of carers by providing them with ongoing secure support. The budget has failed carers. The carer's bonus introduced by the Howard government is only being paid this year because the Labor government was shamed into action. Right. Devastatingly for carers, however, there is no commitment in the budget papers to pay for it in future years. Disgraceful. These men and women 
These carers are the window into our humanity. Their work is done on behalf of all Australians. What modest support they receive from government should be recognised as a wage that saves Australian taxpayers in the order of $30 billion a year. Tonight I give all Australian carers my commitment that we will use the government's inquiry to ensure equitable funding to carers in reflection of the work that you do on our behalf. Yeah. Australian seniors feel let down that the federal budget does very little to ease their cost of living pressures when they've done so much to build this country. That is why we will not support Labor's changes to the income test for the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card, which will leave thousands of seniors without a health card when they need it most. In addressing the future, Mr Speaker, and the course of our nation, we need to identify and respond effectively to five key challenges. The first is the prosperity of our nation. How can we hand to the next generation a level of prosperity of which we can be proud and in which they can have confidence? This will mean taxation reform, not just simplification, but lower taxes overall, and we have already begun that process. Further, how can we prosper when this budget cuts investment in research and development and swings cuts through the CSIRO? The second challenge we face is that of the Federation. It's very important for every one of us to ask ourselves, in this the 21st century, how can we make the Federation work more effectively for our country in the interests of Australians? It will require all of us, in a mature and sober way, to examine the constitutional arrangements and the responsibilities of the three tiers of government, who is responsible for what, how the money is raised and then how it is distributed. The third challenge is that of the environment. We need, as Australians and as global citizens, to begin to live on environmental interest instead of capital. It's time that we focused on water security as food security as much as anything else. Further, Australia alone cannot solve climate change, but we can do enormous environmental and economic damage to our future if we get this wrong. The fourth challenge for us in our future is that of the security of our nation, the defence and protection not only of our country, but increasingly of our people, our interests and the values for which we stand throughout the world. The fifth challenge is to ensure that we are a cohesive society to make sure that we see drug use, alcohol abuse, illiteracy, not only as a human but an economic issue, the existential despair and state of 90,000 Aboriginal people living in remote parts of this country, that we see many other things such as gambling addiction as being no less important to us in our future as getting our under economic fundamentals absolutely right, upon which ultimately success will depend. Before the next election, we will announce policy to shape the future that we want as Australians. We are an opposition, but we are also an alternative government. Our beliefs are in the individual, in the encouragement of and rewards for hard work and self-sacrifice in everyday life. We believe very strongly in the family as the bedrock of Australian society, whilst respecting and reaching out to every other Australian whatever their economic or personal circumstances. We believe in choice. We believe Australians should be encouraged and supported in choice in health, in education, and they should equally be free to join a union or not to join a union. We believe very strongly in defence and security and investment in it for the protection of our nation. We believe very strongly that small family businesses are the lifeblood of, blood of our nation and its economic prosperity. We believe always in lower taxes once our obligations to society in health, education, road, infrastructure and defence and other requirements have been met. We believe ultimately in the individual. We believe that the inherent worth of every single Australian is paramount and that our task as Liberals and as Nationals is to stand up for oppressive bureaucracy and governments that too often and under this new government appear to think that they know what is best for Australians instead of leaving choices and freedoms in the hands of individuals who actually make this country work. Yeah. We believe that we will be at our best as a nation if we see ourselves and strive to be an outward-looking, 
highly competitive and compassionate people, reconciled with our Indigenous history and imbued with fundamental values of hard work, of self-sacrifice and courage, tolerance and determination to see that we support one another, we respect our freedoms and we stand up for the rights, values and freedoms not only of all Australians but all people throughout the world. Thank you. Yeah. Order. In accordance with the resolution agreed to yesterday, the House stands adjourned until 12 noon Monday, the 26th of May, 2008.